Let's get started. If you will, turn your Bibles to Psalm 73. Psalm 73. And let's look at this psalm. Psalm 73, we'll begin with verse 1. Surely God is good to Israel, even to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There are no pains in their death. Their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride is like a chain about their neck, and violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff, and in wickedness utter oppression. They speak loftily. They have set their mouth in the heavens, and their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, his people return hither. And waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. And being always at ease, they increase in riches. Surely in vain have I cleansed my heart and washed my hands in innocency. For all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. What were you doing on Tuesday, April the 19th at 9.03 a.m.? I'm sure that just floods right back into your memory banks, right? That was the same day that the first shots were fired at Concord, but that was years earlier. In 1995, that was the day and the time that the fire was started at Waco, Texas, at a compound that held a cultic group. And 80 people perished that day as we watched in horror as those buildings went up in flames. That's the same day, April 19th, that the federal building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City was bombed, where the front was literally taken off the building. 168 men, women, and unfortunately children that were on the second floor of that building were killed. When it occurred... In fact, when all events like that occur, and they're astronomical, and the loss of life is is huge, people ask the same question. That is why. Why would something like that happen? It's been 20 years since 9-11, and people are still asking the question, why did that happen? Why 3,000 people all of a sudden vanish? And some of them being first responders. Do you remember the Metrolink crash of some years ago? A guy that was a colleague of mine at uh, Oaks Christian was killed in that. He sat across from me in a desk all along. There were a lot of innocent people killed in that too. Because somebody wasn't paying attention to a light. And we ask, why? And then let's not even go and talk about the Holocaust. We could talk about tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And the same question keeps popping up. Why does this happen? Why do bad things happen to good people? Now, when we talk about this type of thing, what I want to, first of all, label is is something I'm not talking about. What I'm not talking about this morning is pain after we sin. Or in other words, when Paul wrote the Galatians, in Galatians 6 and verse 7, he says, What's where a man sows, that shall also reap. That's true. So God is love, and because of that love, he gives us a thing called moral choice. We make choices in life. So when a person jumps off a bridge, don't blame God when you hit the bottom. You made the choice. So the consequences are inevitable. If a person drinks excessively, then... They may end up with brain damage, may end up with cirrhosis of the liver. Why? As a result of what they did. If a person smokes excessively, they may end up with cancer or emphysema or something else simply because 
of the of result of what they did. That God had nothing to do with it. You made the choice. If somebody is sexually promiscuous, they may end up with AIDS or an STD or something like that. Why? Because God hates them or something? No, because they made the choice. And that's a result of the choice. You see, there are people who drive too fast. There are people who lie. There are people who cheat. There are people who do all types of things. And eventually, they'll pay the penalty for their actions. Why? Because that's the, that's the idea. If you <coughs> sin, there's going to be consequences of that sin. So I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the question of why does it seem like that righteous people suffer and that wicked people just get away with it? They just seem to have no problems at all. This is the question that was posed in this psalm. Because that's what the author of this psalm saw. Life has a lot of perplexing questions that it throws at us all the time. And this, I think, is one of them. And that is, why do bad things happen to good people? An innocent child is born, say, deformed or mentally incapable. A useful adult in the prime of his life is cut down by some senseless accident or some act of, of, of that, that somebody just takes upon themselves maybe to shoot someone or something like that. We just go, why did that happen? What, what, was, the, what was the purpose in that? Or somebody outlives all usefulness and they're just, they're hanging on to life, but they become a burden to themselves and to others and they can't give anything. We say, why is that going on? What, what's the purpose? We ponder. Why would an all-knowing, good God allow things like this to happen? Because we see them happen all the time. And one thing I know in the Bible that when tough questions like this come up, it's not a sin to question God. Maybe the sin is not to question God. Maybe the sin is to try to figure it out all by ourselves and not to allow God a little levity here. The second problem is this. Why do good things happen to bad people? Why does it seem like they're just getting away with it? And all you have to do is turn on television and watch it. And you see all these reality shows and all this stuff and all these people that have all this money and all the gold chains and they seem to just be living in luxury in the Bahamas and all this kind of stuff. And you say, but their life is, is directly against the scriptures. But that's the case. That's the way it is with society. I guess that's the way it always has been. Many things are explained away that uh, maybe God's punishing me for something that I did that was wrong. Like when I was little... You know those little irritating bumps you get on your tongue every once in a while? I was told as a child that was a lie bump. That I had lied, and that was a result of me lying, was getting a lie bump on my tongue. Well, man, I must have lied a ton, because I was getting those things all the time. I don't know what it was. But Job's friends thought the same thing. In the book of Job, you go and look at the three or four friends of his that come and talk to him. The whole thing is what you do. And he says, I didn't do nothing. They said, well, you had to have done something because God's punishing you for whatever you did. And he keeps coming up with saying, I didn't do anything. Because you see, they thought that if you sin in this life, you ought to be punished in this life. In John chapter 9. Verses 1 through 3, Jesus and his disciples are walking around, and they see a man that is born blind. And the disciples say, who sinned that this man was born blind? Was it himself, or was it his parents? In other words, what did he do that was wrong? Was it what, Did he sin against somebody here? Was there something in the environment, you know, something like that? Was there something going on there? And Jesus says, none of that's true. This happened. So that the works of God could be made manifest in it. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't really answer the question. Did he sin? Or, and he says, no, it just happened. So that the works of God could be made manifest. To answer that, we need to go back to Psalms 73. In Psalm 73, you have a very heavy problem that's weighed upon by a Hebrew musician 
that it's not David. David didn't write this song. In fact, if you look at the byline, the author's name is Asaph. He lived during the reign of David, about a millennia uh, before uh, Jesus. And we don't know a lot about him, except we do know he was a musician in the king's court. When King David brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem and they had the singers and, and it says uh, the mu musical instruments were there to raise sounds of joy, 1 Chronicles 15. Asaph is mentioned specifically in verse 19 as one of the singers who was playing, uh, what does it say, the bronze cymbals. Now, once the Ark was placed in Jerusalem, what David decided to do was to institute regular rituals to celebrate the Ark of the Covenant being there. Because this was the place where, that had supposedly the presence of God. And if the presence of God was there, then that was good. So it says in 1 Chronicles 16, he appointed certain of the Levites as ministers before the Ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. And Asaph was the chief. So Asaph is the chief musician in the court of David. And we find out that obviously he's kind of the choir master or something to do with the music that goes on. But he is also someone that generations afterward, the sons of Asaph continue this in the, the region of the court. So he, along with his descendants, are the musicians that accompany all the music that's going on in the temple. In addition to all of that, we obviously know he's a composer. Because he composed 10 of the psalms that are in psalms, and this is one of them. So you have composer, musician, in the court of David, that has a problem. And here's the way he diagnoses his case. He says, number one, my faith is built on one proposition. This is verse one. If people do right, God's going to bless them. And if people do wrong, God, God's going to punish them now. And that's important. If I do right, I'm going to be blessed now. If I do wrong, I'm going to be punished now. And he says that was great, except verse three, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It's not happening now. And in verse 6, he describes them as people of arrogance, prideful, violence, scoffing, malice. These are not good people. In fact, he just puts it down in verse 12 and just says they're just wicked. And it appears they're getting away with it. They don't seem to have any problems at all. And look at verse 4. They have no pains. Their bodies are sound and sleek. They're not in trouble as other men are. They're not stricken like other men. And the dilemma worsened when it seemed as if not only are they not getting punished, they're being blessed. Their eyes swell out with fatness. Verse 7. You have to understand the ancient world, if a person was described as being fat, that actually meant they had enough to eat, which meant that they were super blessed and probably very wealthy. So when you see these pictures of people that look like they're a little bit overly rotund, what the painter is saying is that these people were very, very blessed. They weren't like the people that didn't have enough to eat that were skinny and, you know, out there. Because in our society, of course, that's looked upon as valuable. And not in that day and time. If you were overweight, that was great. That was good stuff. Besides that, he says in verse 12, they're always at ease. They increase in riches. And to make it even worse, the common people fawned on them for their success. Verse 10, the people turn and praise them. They find no fault in them. To the man on the street, the prosperous, jet-set, wicked was the thing to be. That was the way it was supposed to be. That hadn't changed. <laughs> we still know that to be true. And then to add insult to injury, they actually mock God. In verse 11, how can God know? They scoffed. Is there knowledge in the Most High? They're thumbing their nose at God and they're getting away with it. 
and God isn't doing one thing about it. And Asaph turns green with envy. Look at verse 3. I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he pitied himself. In verse 14, he says, all in vain. It was completely in vain that I kept myself clean. I washed my hands in innocence. What am I getting out of it? All day long, I've been stricken and chastened every morning. For what? They're wicked and they're prospering and I'm trying to do all this stuff and I'm not. In fact, he says his spiritual state got so low, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had well nigh slipped. Verse 2. In other words, when good things happen to bad people, it almost destroyed his faith. He almost lost it. Why? Because of his premise that if I'm doing good, God's going to reward me now. If I'm doing bad, God's going to punish me now. But what if that premise is wrong? Let's figure out the problem. I'm going to look at this in three different ways. Number one, we cannot begrudge the generosity of God. It's called grace. Do you remember in Matthew 20, when there's people that are hired at 8 in the morning, then people that are hired at 12, then people that are hired at 6, and the people that are hired at 6 work about an hour, and they get paid the same wage as those that have been there all day long. And the people that have been there all day long start griping and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why are you paying these Johnny-come-latelys the same thing that you paid us? It's a good question. It doesn't seem fair, does it? I work an 11-hour day and somebody get, works an hour and they get paid the same thing as me? And yet one thing we need to understand about God and His grace is that He's extremely lavish with it. In fact, in Matthew 5, it says he squanders it on all people. And the landowner asks a good question. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Do you begrudge my generosity? In other words, I didn't make any contract with you. I made a contract with you that I'd pay you this. I paid you that. And I made a contract with them that I'd pay them this. I paid them that. You don't have me say so with it. It's my money. I can do with it what I want to. And God can do with his grace whatever he wants to. Because remember, he reads the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We don't. Number two. Physical pain is absolutely necessary for us to survive. We have to have it. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, if there was a good God, we wouldn't have such, you know, such painful situations. There's a story about a boy in India that was born where the spinal cord was not attached to his brain in such a way that he could feel pain. He couldn't feel pain at all. And you think, well, that would be the greatest thing ever. Except when he's 11 months old and in his little hut, his mother was cooking and she had the furnace heated up very, very hot. And the child went over and put his hands on him and kept them there. And the mother started smelling flesh burning and ran over and pulled his hands off of it. But his hands were mangled from that day forward. But he couldn't feel the pain. The pain didn't tell him, you know, pull back, don't, don't touch, don't keep your hands there. He just kept there. Months later, he came to his hut and he collapsed. His mother found out that he cut his foot pretty badly and was bleeding to death, and she bandaged it up and everything, but he couldn't know. He couldn't tell her because he couldn't feel any pain. At the age of nine, the story goes that he came in, laid down on a little mat in there, and died. The autopsy showed that his appendix had ruptured. But he couldn't feel the pain, and he couldn't say, something's wrong down here, I don't know what's happening. And so because of that, he died. Pain tells us something is wrong. Pain tells us something needs attention. 
A bee is conceived in a tiny cell of wax. When it's trying to get out of that cell of wax, it struggles and there's a um, an outward skin that it has to shed. And in the struggle to get out, it sheds that outward skin, it frees the wings, and then it can fly. But if a moth comes in and eats away at that coating and it's freed on its own, it isn't freed, the wings aren't freed, and the rest of the group will come in and sting it to death. Because it's useless. The struggle is necessary for it to survive. You see, through all that we go through, through everything that happens to us, God says there is a purpose. In Psalms 46 and verse 10, he says, Be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we have to back up. We have to sit down. We have to look at this whole thing and say, what is going on? Why is this happening? And God says, take some time out. Get with me. David said, I'll praise thee. I will fearfully and I know I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and that my heart knoweth right well. And we all know that David had a life of extreme joy and happiness completely every day of his life. He had no problems whatsoever. His son didn't rebel against him and try to take the kingdom away from him. He wasn't chased by Saul for two years in the wilderness. He didn't go out on the plane to battle Goliath. And yet he still ends up in Psalms 139 saying, I will praise thee. I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that my soul knoweth right well. Through all of it, he's finally figuring out that you're God and I'm not. The way that our bodies are made is we don't have to get an oil change every 25,000 miles. Sometimes we feel like we need one, but we don't get that. We don't have a transmission change or a valve job or anything like that. It pretty much goes on the way it is. And part of that survival is pain. Physical, emotional, and spiritual. And that pain helps us to survive. That's how we have emotions like sympathy and love and compassion. You see, I can't communicate with somebody and say, oh, I know what you're going through if I haven't gone through it. There's a difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy means I feel sorry for you. Empathy means been there, done that. I feel your pain. So if you've been there and you've done that, you actually have a talent. Because now you can tell somebody, I understand where you are. I know what you're going through. Here's how I handle it. Because I made it, you can make it. Because without pain, how do you enjoy success? How do you understand the concept of happiness or fulfillment if you've not had unhappiness? Or the opposite of what fulfillment is. How do you cultivate patience and bravery without going through pain? It might do well for us to remember that the only place on earth where it's always sunshine is the desert. And we know what happens if somebody tries to live in the desert. If it's not, if water's not introduced, if cultivation's not introduced, it's just a dead place. For people who sit with other people and you watch, say, a um, tender movie about something that is, is heart-wrenching and that individual can't even shed a tear. They can't even feel any empathy whatsoever or sympathy for the people that are the screen that's going on and that type of thing. What makes us think that they're going to feel anything for us when we go through something as well? There are people like that. Hitler, Mussolini, Charles Manson. Seem to have had no conscience whatsoever. They could sit and watch the saddest of human experiences. They could use and abuse people. They could watch people being murdered. Didn't matter to them. They didn't care. Some years ago, I heard a story about a New York woman that was stabbed for 30 minutes in a downtown area where there were 1,100 men in the vicinity and not one person lifted their hand to help her. I would submit to you that anybody can refuse the needs of another person. 
But a man of strength would stand over a city and say what I quoted a moment ago. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and kills those who were sent to you. How often I've wanted to gather you as a hen does her, her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. And you know it broke his heart because he could see what was going to happen to that city that was standing before him in just a few years. He even prophesied it. Do you realize that Jesus Christ paid his life because of the ability that he had to relate to the needs of other people? That's all he did. He sees somebody that's blind. He sees somebody that's dead. He sees somebody that's got a withered hand. He sees people with leprosy. And what does he do? Sometimes he'll heal the whole city because he related to their needs. He knew that whatever they needed to do, that wholeness and that completeness in them could not be achieved without the wholeness and the completeness of their physical body. And so he took care of them. He could relate to their needs. That's always what he did. There's a story about a uh, five brothers out in the West that had been faithful at one time to the Lord, but the affairs of the world took their minds and they just decided to do whatever they wanted to do and basically fell out and just had nothing to do with God or the church or anything else. One day, while one of them was out farming, a rattlesnake bit him and it took him a while to get him to the hospital, so he was in pretty serious condition. The other four brothers rushed to the hospital. The minister is there. They all start praying together and making all kinds of promises that if God will heal him, you know, so on and so forth, that we'll come back and so on and so forth. And so the one that was bitten, that's in the bed, really began to reflect and repent and to think about how he really needed to change his life. And when he got out of the hospital, he made good on that promise. He became very involved with the Lord's work and and his brothers, they went back to their old way of life. The minister one Sunday got up and prayed, God, please send us four more rattlesnakes. <laughs> Why? Because pain brings us back to recognition of who we are. It humbles us. It helps us to see that we need God. Paul recognized this and wrote to the Corinthians about this in 2 Corinthians 12. To keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Three times I plead with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest in me. That's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardship, persecutions, difficulties. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. Sometimes it takes a tragedy. Sometimes it may take sickness. To get us to reflect on who we are. And at those times, we begin to realize that money or friends or our influence or all the power that we have in whatever situation we want to talk about really doesn't matter a whole lot. As Paul said in Romans, none of us lives to himself alone and none of us dies to himself alone. We're either gods or we're not. And God himself would say in the book of Revelation, to those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. And so for some of us, we're sitting there going, well, God must love me a lot then. Holy smoke. This has been a tough year on some of us. We have had isolation. We have had sickness. We have had COVID. We have had flu. We have had people with all types of diseases and problems and people that are sick that are around us and this type of thing, we go, well, God really must love me a lot. Well, he, he must, because for those that everything, if everything is sunshine and roses, maybe God can't trust them with anything. So he must love us quite a bit. 
And remember, when you're overcome with troubles, if you find yourself suffering, take it to heart. There's some reason behind it. There was a Red Cross nurse, I read about several years ago, in Reader's Digest, who was at a terrible train accident. And she was running around ministering to as many people as she could in the midst of this. And she said she saw one man that obviously was in shock that was just walking around. And he was saying, my instruments, my instruments, if only I had my instruments, my instruments, my instruments, if only I had my instruments. Well, she couldn't figure out what he was talking about. So she just went on and helped some other people. Found out later that this was a very prominent surgeon that was on the train. And that what he was saying was if I just had my surgical instruments, I could render aid to all these people that are that are here. But I, without them, I, I, I don't know what to do. I wonder if God's asking the same about us. My instruments, my instruments. If only I had my instruments. You see, we can bring pain and despair into the world... Or we can be used by God to show people how we handle it. That doesn't mean it's going to be taken away. But there is a means by which we take to heart how to handle certain situations, certain situations that arise. And bad ones especially. Can we say with Isaiah, in Isaiah 38 and verse 7, Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. Can we sing with Asaph? Who have I in heaven but thee that I desire besides thee? My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That's Psalm 73 at the end of the psalm, verse 25. Victor Frankl wrote a book some years ago that was... If you haven't ever read anything about Victor Frankl, he's a survivor of the Holocaust. Um, you might read this book, Man's Search for Meaning. And here's what he said in his book. After going through the Holocaust and being a survivor and seeing family and friends just destroyed by this process, here's what he said. To live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning in the suffering. Anybody can give up. But the strong are the ones that find meaning in the suffering. Why? Because then we can help others with theirs. But if we give up, we can't help anybody with what they're going through. But if we survive, and we will, God will see that we do. We now have a talent and an ability. And God says, now I can be seen. Now my will can be heard. Now things will be the way that I want them to be. Because you survived, now others will survive. Because you're helping me help them. So why do good people suffer? So that we can learn. We can learn God's will. We can learn how to survive. And we can help other people survive. And it's not easy. It's not supposed to be. But the process, while being painful, is necessary for our survival. Just think what David would have been if he had never gone through what he went through. Never would have been king. Always was a little shepherd out there with his sheep playing his little lute, writing songs that nobody would ever hear. Or he can become one of the most infamous individuals that was known as a man after God's own heart. But look at what it took to get him there. Is that what it takes to get us to where God wants us? Maybe. All I would tell you is don't lose faith. Be faithful. And at the end, he said, you'll receive a crown of life. Because you see, the reward doesn't come here. The reward comes 
when we go to be with him. And then that's for eternity. And that's the best reward ever. As we think about these things, and we look at our lives, let's just contemplate what God is putting us through, what, what we have been through, what, what we have uh, had happen in our lives, and where we are now, and where is it that God wants us to be? I don't know. But whatever is happening, whatever is going on in your life, it is God's will, and it is God's purpose. What we have to find out is, how do I handle it? And if I do it the right way, I'll receive a crown of life. And I'll help other people to receive the same thing. That's the whole purpose anyway of this whole thing. It's not to go alone, but to take a whole bunch of others with us. Which is what I want to do. So, as we think on these things, if there's something in your life that you need to change, something that you need to consider, some uh, prayers, uh, rededication, restoration, baptism, whatever... Whatever it is, we stand ready to help you as the ambassadors of Jesus Christ and ambassadors of God. Not as perfect people, but as imperfect people that have found a better way. We want you to also. As together we stand and sing to encourage you.